Okay, let's start. So today I welcome um, Gunther Hostmann, um, who has been in, in touch and is, was already here. We were just talking about this in Lisbon a few years ago to, to present in person. Today we have him here um, via Zoom. Um, so uh, Gunther Hostmann is a has a, um, a very special skill set. So he's a trained clockmaker as well as an historian of, of science and of astrology and astronomy. He has worked um, on the um, the clockworks and the the making of the clock of the Strasbourg Cathedral. Uh, and he has published a lot on those topics, as well as several other uh, papers and works on the history of astrology, on, on several aspects of early modern history of astrology. Um, he has been a professor at the Technical University of Berlin and has a numerous uh, fields of interest within the early modern period. Um, so we welcome you, Gunther, and... Uh, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis, for the kind words. I will speak to you about Heinrich Ranzau and his attitude towards astrology this evening. The members of the Ranzau family, the most prominent being Heinrich Ranzau, left such a marked impression on Schleswig-Holstein in the period between the Reformation and the beginning of the Thirty Years' War that the historian Otto Brandt once called it the Ranzau Age. For more than 40 years, Heinrich Ranzau, belonging to the oldest nobility of the duchies, was a governor of three Danish kings, that is, Christian III, Frederick II and Christian, Christian IV. He achieved European fame less as a military person and politician rather than as a leading representative of humanistic edu education and culture. Heinrich Ranzau was a personality with diverse interests and because of his passion for books and his patronage in various fields of humanistic learning, and art, he was considered a black swan among his contemporary noblemen. His activities as a landlord, financial and commercial entrepreneur, patron of the arts, builder and politician have occupied historians from the 17th century on to the present day. Quite the opposite, Ranzau's astrological inclinations and preoccupations have been, have been mentioned, if at all, rather in passing. In my postdoctoral thesis, I've tried to shed some light on this facet of his personality. Ranzau was an exceptional figure in this field as well, since he was not only a famous client of astrologer, but also an expert writer who was in command of the astronomical and mathematical requirements. Ranzau was born on March 11th, 1526 at 10, 10 hours, 31 minutes in the evening in Steinberg Castle, north, northwest of Hamburg. Of the building, only a mound surrounded by trees remains. Here you can see a photograph of the site which is a preserved area now. His father, Johann, is said to have been deeply impressed by Luther's appearance at the Diet of Worms and sent his 12-year-old son to study in Wittenberg in 1538. Ranzau's lifelong preoccupation with the stars is a result of his 10-year stay in the stronghold of Reformation theology and it was Philip Melanchthon's appreciation of astrology that had a decisive influence on him. 
For Melanchthon, the stars were mediators between the div divine will and man. With the movement, move movements of the heavenly bodies, their eclipses and con conjunctions, God gave visible signs that had to be carefully observed. Astronomy, therefore, had the task of observing the heavens and reading the will of God in them as in an open book. The basis for the influence of the stars on, the, on, on Earth and its inhabitants was the worldview of Aristotle. Here you can see a, schema, a schematic di diagram taken from uh, free from uh, up here from Frisius's cosmography. According to Aristotle's conception of the cosmos, the sphere below the orbit of the moon, which is which is subject to constant change, and consists of the of the four elements: earth, fire, water, and and air is surrounded by the unchanging spheres of the planet and fixed stars. I have to correct myself, this was from Apian, Cosmographicus Liber, published in Antwerp, 1533. However, the nature and, and actions of man are not determined solely, solely by, the, by the influence of the stars, but in Melanchthon's view, depend on three factors. First, the temperament determined by the stars is, is subject to the, to the human will, which can support or oppose it according to the principle astra inclinant non, non necessitant. The stars incline, but they do not determine. Secondly, God is completely free and can also guide people against their inclinations. As a third cause, Melanchthon cites the, the, cites the evil that drives pe even people with good dispositions to crime or to misfortune. Every student in Wittenberg must have come into contact with astrology, so that it is certainly no exaggeration when the, when the Hungarian bishop and humanist Andreas Dudit wrote to his friend Johannes Pretorius in 1584, I quote, I am surprised that there are so many in our German country, especially among those who come from the University of Wittenberg, with whom these astrological prophecies enjoy great authority. In 1556, Heinrich Ranzau was appointed governor of the Danish king in the duchies. On his main estate of Breitenberg, which you can see here, he set up a large library, which at the time was one of the largest collections of books in Europe and contained 6,300 volumes. Its final hour came at the end of September 1627, when Wallenstein's troops overran Breitenburg after a prolonged siege and wreaked havoc. The library was looted, and in the course of the Thirty Years' War, some books came to Prague, and from there were scattered across Europe, all over Europe, especially in Sweden. A detailed description of the eventful history of the library is outside the scope of the scope of this lecture, however. But even from the sparse remains, it can be guessed that, it, that its astronomical and astrological holdings must have been enormous. Wallenstein, who was known to be devoted to astrology, certainly knew exactly that a highly significant and precious collection of astrological books and manuscripts would fall into his hands. The books and manuscripts at Breitenburg formed the basis for, Ray, for Ranzau's astrological book, book publications, the first of which was a treatise on the preservation of health, the Conservanda Valitudine, originally intended for private use in the family, and in, in, and in addition to listing regularities for a healthy lifestyle, in which Ranzo often referred to, Greek, to the Greek physician and natural scientist Galen, the book deals with the causes of the destruction of the, of the human body. The two main causes for this are the two main causes of disease, decay, and death 
are original sin and influences of the heavenly bodies combined with an unfavorable mixture of the humors. God has not only placed the heavenly bodies in the sky to distinguish the years, days, and months, but these are also <clears throat> these are also signs for people from which the events of the future could be discerned. Therefore, it was important to know one's own horoscope, and one should use the birthday as an occasion to study it in preparation for coming events. The first edition, published in 1574, was followed by 10 more editions until the beginning of the 17th century. And the text was also translated twice into German and Czech during Ranzau's lifetime. In 1617, an English translation appeared in London, which was reprinted seven years later. In 1576, his Catalogus Imperatorum Regum Aquirorum Illustrium, a directory of the regents and famous men who appreciated, practiced, or promoted astrology, was published. The book also presented a listing of successful predictions of unsuspected events, and it was reprinted six times until 1593. In 1593, the Tractatus Astrologicus appeared. This can be regarded as Ranzo's main astrological work. The, the 355 page book contains the various methods of dividing the houses, the meanings of the, the, meanings of the 12 houses, signs of the zodiac and planets, as well as various <coughs> as well as various prediction techniques. It was an astrological, astrological compendium for the practicing astrologer. Without discussing philosophical underpinnings or getting into arguments about the value and justification of astrology, interpretations and rules are dealt with systematically. The rapid succession of reprints, seven editions were printed until 1633, shows that the book was in demand. Even in the 17th century, it was considered as a standard work, and in 1657, a French translation was published. Ransau's astrological book publications, two astronomic, astronomical astrological calendars should also be mentioned, are without exception compilations of various texts and tables, and he assumed more the role of an editor rather than as an, as an author in the true sense of the world, word. After the selection of texts, the actual editing will have been in the hands of the numerous scholars who were temporarily active at Breitenberg, especially Georg Ludwig Frobenius, Adrian Fossenhol, Thomas Fink, and Peter Lindeberg. However, one has to be cautious when assessing this kind of literary production, for it was precisely in the astrological field that original achievements and innovations were least in demand. The highest, the highest ideal here was to appeal to time-honored doctrines, and since traditions played such an important role, it was obvious to compile the most comprehensive compendia and synopsis possible. Moreover, Heinrich Ranzau could display his ambitions by presenting sumptuously bound copies of his book to learned contemporaries. For example, Markus Welser, humanist and publisher in Augsburg. Here you can see this presentation copy, exclusively stamped for Welser with a personal dedication. Ranzo sought to prove the legit, legit, legitimacy of astrology through history by offering a list of famous men in the Catalogus Imperatorum who, pre, who practiced and promoted astrology, together, together with a list of successful predictions. In his Tractatus Astrologicus, he attempted to, syst, to systematize the 
the doctrinal edifice by means of a concordance, like compilation of rules of interpretation, and to expand it by bringing in new manus manuscript sources from his own collection. Thus, in 1586, at Ranzau's instigation, a Greek manuscript of the introduction to astrology by the Hellenistic astrologer Paulus Alexandrinus was published by the Wittenberg professor of physics, Andreas Schato, together with the Latin translation. True to the humanist motto ad fontes, Ranzau evidently hoped to recover bar buried ancient knowledge by editing the text which was the only surviving copy yet in possession. Here is the title page. The manuscript is unfortunately no longer extant. It disappeared in the course of the Thirty Years' War. In summary, it can be said that he approached the problems of histology with systematics and empiricism. In this context, the special device kept in the Berlin Museum of Decorative Arts is, Arts is worth mentioning. It consists of two hexagonal tablets connected by hinges, which could be carried comfortably in one's pocket. On the external faces, the five essential planetary dignities, that is houses, triplicities, exaltations, terms and faces, as well as the elementary qualities of the planets and signs are engraved in tabular form. And the inner faces, you can see here, display the rising times of the zodiacal signs, of the zodiacal signs, the true place of the sun, and the length of day and night calculated for the latitude of Breitenburg, 55 degree north, the contemporary value of the 15th, 16th century. This useful astrological ad memoir could most appropriately be called a tabular instrument. But, not, not, but it was not least the author himself who bore witness to the capacities of astrology with his horoscope, which he included within, within each of his books with details, explanations, and interpretation. The earliest surviving example emerged in the circle of the Wittenberg professor of mathematics, Erasmus Reinhold, and was probably calculated while Ranzo was still a student. It can be found in a janitor collection preserved in the University Library of Leipzig. Such collections, which could include several hundred sample horoscopes, served astrologers of the 16th and 17th centuries as an important aid for documentary and comparative purposes. In 1578, a commentary on Ptolemy's Tetrabiblos, the Bible of astrology, of, of astrologers, was published in Basel by Konrad Dasipodius professor of mathematics at the Strasbourg Gymnasium and designer of the astronomical clock of Strasbourg, Strasbourg Cathedral. Dasipodius preceded his work with the horoscopes of Heinrich Ranzau and his wife, Christina von Halle. The, birth the, the, the time of birth given to the, is given to the second in the middle field of the horoscope chart, that is 10 hours, 31 minutes, 36 seconds post meridian, which is of course rectified, that is calculated re retrospectively from important life events. It is a night birth with all the planets except Venus below the horizon. Next to the horoscope chart, the geographical coordinates, longitude 26 degrees 40 minutes, latitude 50 54 degrees 44 minutes, and the amount of the equation of time are noted in the, in the upper left corner. The planetary positions have been calculated according to the Alphonsine tables, and the, the, the applied house division is Regio Montan, as to be expected from a 16th century horoscope. However, 
the horoscope probably does not go back directly to Dasipodius, but may have been cast by Ranzo himself. On the, on the one hand, a copy of a letter to Cyprianus Leovitius, astrologer of Otto Heinrich, from 1571 has been preserved, in which Ranzo explains and interprets a horoscope figure here apparently enclo enclosed. This horoscope, which has not survived, was intended for a collection of nativities of famous personalities, which Leovitius was compiling at the, at the time. Furthermore, in a manuscript collection in the Austrian National Library, there are two circular horoscope schemes with interpretations by Leovitius. It's, it is, in fact, his own hand, which exactly correspond to the Basel print. You can see the page here. Dasipodios has rendered the following brief interpretation. I quote, first, the sun in exaltation bestows excellent honors and dignities. Second, two planets in their own domiciles make famous and provide radiant and glorious happiness in the greater part of life, and the native will be successful and happy in his actions. Third, Jupiter as a natural signific significator of religion conjoined with Venus and looking at the moon and Mercury in sextile, make one who strives for piety, true religion, sincerity, modesty, and the other virtues. Fourth, Mercury in the corner, that is in an angular house, gives agility of mind and study of science and doctrines, especially in mathematics and the natural sciences. Fifth, the conjunction of Mercury with the moon in whatever sign produces excellent talents. In them is not only a high quality of natural endowments, but also diligence and sagacity. But the retrograde Mercury in some way hinders the actions, but not the talent. Sixth, Mars as a, signif as a significator of diseases brings warm and dry diseases of the body. Seventh, Jupiter is a general significator of wealth and in the seventh house, seventh house brings lasting wealth from a marriage for the whole of life, especially if it is strong and happily placed. Eighth, the seventh, the seventh house with its well-established significators gives a particularly happy marriage, especially if benefic planets are in the seventh house. If they are fortunate and powerful, they, they promise a noble, rich, and well-endowed wife with a decent living. If the moon is in good aspect, they give a peaceful and well-going marriage. Ninth, significators of journeys promise honorable ventures because of things belonging to Jupiter and such actions performed in view of or because of royal persons. Even if one takes into account that some things may have been inter interpreted post festum, Heinrich Ranzo was already over 50 years old and at the peak of his life in 1578, Dasipodius had elaborated an interpretation that undoubtedly did justice to both the social position and the scientific ambitions of his patron and client. A closer look at the horoscope scheme reveals the following aspect relations. I have redrawn it here in a modern way, in a circular scheme. Sun in conjunction with Saturn, Venus in conjunction with Jupiter, Saturn in sextile to Mercury, Moon sextile to Jupiter, Venus sextile to Mercury and the Moon, Mercury conjunct the Moon. In 2000, this is now 22 years ago, I asked the late Robert Zoller to work on a delineation of Ranzo's horoscope, and he kindly agreed. His starting point was a variant of the horoscope by Thomas Fink, who at the time had calculated the planetary positions according to the Protanic tables. Zoller's, Zoller's astrological assessments and comments are based on a recalculation with the Janus astrology software. 
since he did not use parameters of the 16th century, the following extracts of his extensive report should be taken, historically speaking, with a grain of salt. And I quote Robert Zoller, Ransau's ascendant is in Scorpio, a fixed sign and indicator of a large family. As befits a knight, Mars is ruler of the first house. In a, in a good house and free from malefics, it denotes boldness and swiftness, dominion, leadership and prestige. Venus and Jupiter near the boundary of the sixth to seventh house give brilliant manners and a, disposi and a disposition for wisdom. He will be known as a strong man with social favor. With the exception of Mercury, which is retrograde, all the planets are of direct and rapid motion that is of great effective power. The sun in particular promises excellent honors and dignities. It is, although somewhat generally, generously considered in its exaltation and in conjunction with Saturn, the native will be of indomitable will and will look at things with prudence before acting, capable of authoritarian rule and a hard worker. Mercury is close to the Imum Zöli and therefore in opposition to the Medium Zöli. The native will be noted for his contributions to education and science, occupy a position of public leadership and authority, and be, show and be show showered with honors. Ransau benefits financially from partnerships, that is business or marriage. His marriage to Christina von Halle, who brought 200,000 thalers as a dowry into, into the marriage was undoubtedly a good match. His financial significator is Jupiter in the fifth house. He derives financial benefits from marriage in the first third of his lifespan and from family and land ownership in the other two thirds. He should be granted a long life and happy old age. There was also the possibility of a sudden, sudden death, however. And this prophecy almost came true around Epiphany in 1592, as Heinrich Ranzau mentioned in a letter to a certain Nicolas Rollenhardt. I quote, Venerable and very famous man, dearest friend, it is not hidden from you that the position of the stars and the, and the aspect of the planets in my geniture indicate to me that I will perish by a miraculous way of death which thing almost happened this year. I was in great danger of my life because nine robbers, whom I had not even attacked with words, set a trap for my, set a trap for my life. And if God in his mercy had not averted it, they would have killed me. While hunting, these assassins lay in wait for my life and wanted to pierce me with bullets fired from rifles. Already after Michael Mars 1591, four assassination attempts had been made. And a description of Ransau's life of circa 1640 states, I quote, in 1591, seven presumably paid assassins waited four times for him in the woods as they, as they suspected he was passing through with loaded rifles to shoot him but he was miraculously saved from this by God. One of them was torn apart and quartered with hot pincers in Segeberg, according to ordinary laws. The others have also received their deserved wages for the most part. In 1592, Ransau commissioned a medal to commemorate his lucky rescue from mortal danger. Numerous copies, year one preserved in the Schleswig-Holsteinische Landesbibliothek in Kiel. Numerous copies were given to his 24 grandchildren and friends. They was, these medals were struck in gold, silver, and bronze. As <clears throat> proof of the accuracy of the predictions made from his horoscope, the event, the event was also publicized in his astrological books. The extant hor revolution horoscopes for 1591 and 1592 did not, did not signify such drastic events, however, but they were annotated by Ransau 
and another hand. The importance of, Ein, of Ranzo's nativity can be seen from the fact that it has been handed down in several versions, calculating, calculated using different parameters, which were commissioned by the governor. And it also adorns the inside of a golden box, which the, Ham, the Hamburg goldsmith Jakob Morris the Elder presented to his patron in 1582, which you can see here. This precious object is still in possession of the Ranzo family. And I had the honor holding it in my hands when visiting Breitenburg years ago. With this very personal gift, Jakob Morris handed over Ranzo's fate to him, secured in a jewel. However, the creation of the, of the Radix horoscope, which allowed conclusions to be, drawn about, to be drawn about the dispositions and character of the respective personality, was not enough. The astrologer's actual, actual work consisted of forecasting, of forecasting events, drawing up annual horoscopes, and choosing the time to perform or refrain from certain actions. For this task, the usual methods of primary directions, progressions, Profections and revolution where revolutions were used. Here's only a very short, well, table with the with these different predictive techniques. Today, such calculations necessary for these procedures can be carried out in seconds with relevant computer programs. But in the 16th century, Astrological calculations were a very difficult and extremely tedious matter requiring comprehensive astronomical and mathematical knowledge. Several people who stayed at Breitenberg from time to time or corresponded with Ranzau were engaged in such work. Among them was the physician Adrian Fossenhol, also he called himself also Alo Pantrodes, who came from the Netherlands. Yet tried to convert Anabaptists, especially Mennonites, in Middleburg, Cologne, and Antwerp in the years 1560 to 70. Treated with this hostility by the Catholic clergy, he came to Hamburg as a refugee in 1570, where Ranzau probably met him. In 1573, with the publication of an astrological calendar, Fossenhol got into a dispute with Hamburg physicians and complained who complained about his use of astrology. The outcome of this dispute, probably motivated by economics, Fossenhol apparently represented unwel unwelcome competition, is not known. Another physician was Wilhelm Misokakus, who lived in Danzig and cast two horoscope for the Danish governor with extensive interpretations in 1583 and 84. Georg Ludwig Frobenius came from Franconia and after studying in Tübingen and Wittenberg went to Denmark in 1591 to study astronomy with Tycho Brahe on the island of Wien. However, Brahe imposed unreasonable conditions on his stay so Frobenius left the island after a short time <clears throat> and entered the service of Ranzau as Hofmeister for his grandson Erik. From 1596 onwards, Frobenius was leaseholder of the Wandsbeck estate, which belonged to Ranzau's property. The titles of, his, of Frobenius's manuscripts, which were still preserved in the Hamburg Cathedral Library at the end of the 18th century, indicate that Frobenius was a very knowledgeable astronomer and astrologer. Unfortunately, all his manuscripts perished in, um, in the 19th century when the Hamburg city burned down to a large extent. Numerous astrological calculations and notes by these personalities are contained in a manuscript, which I have quoted before, of more than 300 leaves in the Austrian National Library in Vienna. This manuscript originally belonged to the library in Breitenburg. This is an important source, allowing detailed insights, insights into the work of 
16th century astrologers. For the birthday of the governor, the revolution horoscope had to be erected every year. And in, and in addition, all important directions had to be determined as well as their times of occurrence calculated. To these reports, Ranzo often added notes about his everyday experiences and activities. Among other things, there is a kind of diary describing the events of his life and illnesses in the year 1549 to 1596 as well as lists in which he states <clears throat> in which the state of health or illnesses of the governor are scrupulously tabulated here an example here you can see times of asthma times of fever times well in which ranzo frequently vomited and so on all noted down with exact dates These papers vividly show how much astrology encouraged introspection, and even the most trivial, trivial events were, thought, were brought into connection with the heavens. Another example you can see here. This is the hand of Adrian Fossenhol. He announced in his forecasts for 1586 that a certain constellation would reduce dangers caused by horses and large animals and that adversity in hunting was not to be feared. But on the left, Ranzo added in the margin, I fell off my horse while hunting, quite contrary to, to his expectations. <laughs> his own children were also objects of study to whom long astrological calculations and interpretations were devoted. In a, book, in a booklet still extant in the Royal Library, Copenhagen, here you can see the binding, the characteristic Ranzau binding. So it's called because of the specific stamps. Ranzau recorded detailed astrological predictions for each of his children in low German. <clears throat> As governor of the Danish king, Ranzau had a very important political position in the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. The power of the, <clears throat> the power constellations and military balance of power required constant attention, and he regularly reported on this in more than 1,000 relations, which he wrote to three Danish kings between 1555 and 1598. These relations also gave the governor the opportunity to express his personal assessment of the situation and to advise the king. It is clear from some of these writings that astrology also played a certain role. For example, in 1567, Ranzo conveyed to the king the prophecy of a mathematician from Antwerp, probably Adrian Fossenhul, according to which Gotha would be taken and the old religion would regain the upper hand in Antwerp. And he added, as in fact has happened. However, he doubted the announcement of a peace treaty between Denmark and Sweden by the same astrologer, saying, I cannot believe this yet, but I hope. In 1567, Ranzo warned the king to beware of canes and spears and in, Fl and in Flensburg, and wrote to the king in April of the following year that the Swedish king Eric the 14th would be captured and perish horribly. He also foresaw the end of the Nordic Seven Years' War two years earlier. In 1578, Ranzau commented on the horoscope of the Duke of Alba, who, according to him, would die in the 73rd year, or at least lose the Netherlands. That an astrologer in 1579 had successfully predicted the calm progress of the feudal granting at Frederiksborg and a dispute with Hamburg filled him with satisfaction. In political negotiations and when dealing with members of his own class, it must have been important for Henry Ranzo to know the horoscopes of the king and personalities of the Holstein nobility to assess his counterpart. Relevant documents have been preserved. 
The year 1582 brought a severe challenge in astrology in, in astrologies. Four of Ranzo's children had already passed away during his lifetime, but the death of his youngest son, Johann, born on February 15th, 1566, he had just gone to he had just gone to Heid, to Heidelberg for studies and died unexpectedly of plague at the age of only 16 seems to have hit him hit him particularly hard as well as for his other children Ranzo had cast his horoscope and written down a long astrological delineation which you can see here in this book of nativities Although Johann would be in mortal danger of death several times in later years, with God's help, he was to reach the age, age of 78 and die of a protracted Saturnine and Mercurial disease, as one so put it. The sudden death in juvenile years was, was not apparent from his nativity. This misfortune worried him greatly. And in 1583, he, contact, he contacted the Frisian physician Sixtus Hemminger, whose refutation of astrology, Astrologie Ratione et Experientia Refutate, had just been published. And Ranzo wrote to Sixtus Hemminger, I quote, but now, when I read your book, I am almost drawn to the opposite opinion because this refutation of astrology of yours seem to, seems to be based on sure and solid grounds. Also because I recently lost my youngest son in Heidelberg, not without a great disturbance of my spirit. Because I was severely beaten by this fate, I did not take much for, it did not take much for me to join you in your opinion about the unreliability of astrology. That is why I keep asking you to investigate my son's directions with the necessary diligence according to the rules of art and to inform me of your judgment on this matter, on his sudden death. There is no doubt that many astrological predictions have been true, for which I have collected many examples in my book on the climacterical years. The historical examples of all times also testify to this. In the discussion with Hemminger, who was very knowledgeable in astrological matters, <clears throat> technical things and problems were in the foreground, in particular, the inaccurate inaccur indications of the planetary positions in eph ephemerides and uncertain geographical coordinates. Conflicting astrological doctrines as a cause of incorrect predictions were also discussed in great detail. Ransal debated the deaths of other family members with Hemminger and conceded that even from an astrological perspective, only one general reason could be given for Johann's death, namely the plague, the plague itself. In his refutation of astrology, Hemminger sought to prove the uncertainty and nullity of astrology on the basis of the horoscopes of 30 well-known personalities including himself, and his, and his aim was to refute the astrological doctrines by means of the predictions drawn from the horoscopes. In this pro process, the horoscope of the Danish governor literally came under the dissecting knife. Hemminger's criticism of the horoscope published by Conrad Dipodius was thoroughly polemical, and his remarks must suck run so personally, and I quote, the moon under the rays of the sun in the lower part of the sky in a moist sign, moistened by Jupiter and Venus, causes, causes the mental faculties to be weakened by its excessive moisture and therefore makes talent stupid, slow and unfit for science. The position of Mercury in Pisces by its fall and regression denotes an, an obstacle in speech and hinders free enunciation and moreover brings unreliability in actions. Those who believe that the stars determine anything about the ways of men seem to have no common sense, since they do not even determine anything about the way between death and life, mortal and immortal things, heaven and earth. 
Meanwhile, Ransau's reaction to Hemminger's book conveyed to the public in his Catalogus Imperatorum was one of genteel restraint. I quote, although Sixtus of Hemminger has published a refutation of astrology, he has nevertheless confessed if in all horoscope, in, if in all horoscopes, the events, the events were in agreement with the directions, then he alone would exalt astrology and practice it above all other sciences in a unique way and worship it as it <clears throat> as if it were divine. However, although Sixtus of Hemminger gives some other examples where the events do not seem to agree at all with the directions, other astrologers have published different judgments from these and put forward other directions and birth times, which they affirm to agree with the things themselves. I, for one, praise his zeal, for it is by arguing that the truth is traced. But I especially like the fact that he ascribes the special causes, cause of events, not to the stars, but to God, as it were, as, it, as the, the Lord of the stars and of us all, which I also do. <clears throat> And never have I believed otherwise, for he freely commands the, indir the indirect causes. Hemingas' attempt to lead astrology ad absurdum out of itself did not go unchallenged. In the last great attempt to <clears throat> rehabilitate astrology in the 17th century, the Astrologia Gallica by Jean Baptiste Morin, published posthumously in 1661. The sword with which Hemminger intended to give astrology the coup de grace was turned against himself. Maureen did not leave it at an argumentative refutation of the preface of Hemminger's book, but took the author's horoscope and recalculated it using Kepler's Rudolphine tables. He leveled the following criticisms at Hemminger apart from the fact that his planetary positions, especially of Mars, were wrong, he failed to correct the aspects, applied the wrong direction key of Ptolemy, Morin himself used the Nybot key, and directed only four significators, namely Ascendant, Medium, Zöli, Sun and Moon. Morin also con <coughs> considered it inadmissible to use the terms, that is boundaries, as promises. After his recalculation, there was now an excellent correspondence between the predictions made from the horoscopes and the events and illnesses of Hemminger's life. Heinrich Ranzau commissioned Paul Virdo to refute Hemminger. He <clears throat> and Hemming, uh, Virdo was asked to calculate all the directions of the 30 horoscopes and check their interpretations, a calculation that must have taken months. However, this refut refutation never appeared. <laughs> Unfortunately, very little is known about Verdung's, Verdung's personalities. personality. He had studied medicine and mathematics, stayed for a time with Konrad Dasipodius in Strasbourg, and was a correspondence partner of Johannes Kepler. As Wallenstein's Hofmeister, Verdung, Verdung traveled, traveled through France and Italy and is said to have awakened in him an inclination for astrology during his cavalier tour. It would be very interesting to know the contents of a second, of a second part of, of the refutation of Hemingas astrology announced in the, in the correspondence with Ransau, into which parts of the re revealing discussion were to be, were to be incorporated. With Hemingas death, however, the correspondence came to an abrupt end in 1584. All counter arguments put forward did not succeed in dissuading Heinrich Ranzau from his point of view. In, in November 1584, he wrote to the historian and philologian Justus Lipsius his summary of the discussion, and I quote, Admittedly, Sixtus von Hemminger has published a rather astute refutation of astrological predictions taken from the treasures and secrets of the of art itself. But one thing he could not achieve. But one thing he could not achieve was to make me leave my fortress, 
which I had once undertaken to defend. For I have seen in all the directions he has published that if only a few minutes are added or taken away, they agree with things. Therefore, that sentence remains firm with me. Art is perfect, but we who practice it are imperfect. I have even brought Sixtus himself to this conviction as he testifies in his letter to me by saying the following words. The heavens spread out and adorned with innumerable lights offer us the image of the book of eternity, but its letter reading and its understanding we do not have perfectly. Of the effect of the stars upon the elements and upon that which is composed of the elements we rightly have no doubt, of which however we comprehend only the smallest part. Ranzo maintained a lively correspondence with the Leiden scholar in the years 1584 to, 99 to 94. However, contact gradually ceased after Lipsius converted to Catholicism in 1591. In 1584, Ranzo had become acquainted with Lipsius's newly published treatise De Constantia. He was very taken with Lipsius' advice and instructions on how to endure life's adversities with steadfastness and equanimity, and read the book repeat repeatedly. In a letter, the governor commented on a chapter of De Constantia. In it, Lipsius spoke out against the idea that fate, fatum, served providence and necessity, while the stars served fate itself. According to the astrologers, no one could escape either fate or the influence of the stars. And I quote Lipsius, mathematical fate is what I call, is what I call that which links and connects all human activities and their outcome to the power of the stars and their constellations. The Chaldeans and the astrologers invented this first who were joined among the philosophers by the sublime Hermes Trismegistos, who subtly distinguished providence, necessity, and fate, when he said, providence is the perfect and absolute reason of God in heaven, with which two other powers are related, necessity and fate. And the fate serves both providence and necessity, but the stars are subject to the fate, for no one can escape from the power of fate, or protect himself from the power of the stars. For the stars are, as it were, the defense and weapons of fate, at whose, at whose discretion they carry out and bring to an end all that happens in nature and otherwise befalls men. And in this ship of fools sit, still today, it is a disgrace to Christendom, the ordinary astrologers. But as, as, as the national, natural fate, I call the succession of natural causes, which, unless prevented by their nature and by their power, produce a certain and at all times the same effect. To this, Heinrich Ranzau, in a letter, emphasized the importance of the mathematical fate and replied to Lipsius, I have no hesitation in affirming that no writing has yet appeared on the subject which discusses in matter so briefly, with such strong concluding proofs, and in so few and appropriate words. <coughs> I agree with you in almost all places, but I believe that I must give more space to fate than you seem to, namely the mathematical one. Nevertheless, I conclude with you that from a first cause, that is from God, then from the providence of this God, everything depends, but that nevertheless, fate and providence are not the same, but that fate is subordinate to providence and necessity and serves them, just as the stars serve fate itself, whose projectiles and weapons they are. If I'm mistaken in this, as many before me have believed various things about fate, then correct me and guide me to the right path. For to you and to the rest of, <laughs> of the servants of wisdom, I submit and I'm ready to follow him who shows the path of truer reason. In a letter written to Lipsius only a few days later, Ranzo again formulated Philip Melanchthon's 
astrological credo, which was formative for, for his view in all clarity. And I quote, I am convinced of the following, that fate is the law and the rule of nature laid, laid down by God, born of providence, but that the stars are the servants of fate itself and the executors of divine appointment and the tasks of nature, and that everything below follows their harmonious and orderly course and their various movements. Hence, I freely say that this is my opinion, that all our deeds and that which is yet to be done depend on God and his providence from which fate arises, as also on the stars which serve fate in their turn, and which are its projectiles and weapons, and that also the lower things are directed by the exact arrangement of the heavenly bodies. For God makes use of their service, as it were, by mediators and second causes, and their ability, power, and eff efficacy, eff efficacy, which he himself gave them at creation, he still preserves and cherishes, as long as it pleases him, and as it was established with him from the beginning. The great interpreter of Holy Scripture, Augustine, also speaks in this way. For he says that fate is an order and division of secondary causes to produce consequences in these transitory and emergent things without the, invent without the intervention of the will of God and man. Anthony Grafton has shown that astrology in the 16th century could be an art of sensitive, precise description and assessment of the profoundly human with the aspiration to drive em empirical research to the depth of, of the self. It demanded intensive practice in the art of character assessment and much introspec introspection and encouraged innovative experimentation in the presentation and documentation of the results of investigations. At least as consistently as those contemporary of Machiavelli's ilk who, sub who subjected politics and history to close analysis in search of the effective truth of thing. And as the Stoics who, who disciplined their egos in writing, astrologers and their clients worked on a fundamental and profoundly modern project. Something of this spirit can also be felt in Heinrich Janssel, who always gave an account of his life and the position of the stars. <clears throat> Ratione autoritate experien experientia, that is scientific method, <clears throat> rep reputation or authority and experience. These are marginal notes to Cardano's Libelli Duo by Tycho Brahe. With these, with these three keywords, one could sum up Heinrich Ranzau's relationship to astrology. For him, astrology was based on mathematical and astronomical foundations. Ancient authorities, first and foremost Ptolemy, had shaped the doctrine, historical experience and his own life confirmed its correctness. Today, only few would subscribe to the certainty and share the opinion that one must strive eagerly to understand the language of the heavens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunther. Thank you very much for your for your your essay. And um, I would open the floor to questions. Does anyone have a question? Samuel, please. Yes, a, a very minor uh, question. Thank you very much, Günther. Um, I um, remember the 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 list you you showed us uh, that showed the um, 
the, the types of computations, as astronomical, astrological calculations that were made uh, for the, um, the Ranzau's horoscope. Uh, there were directions, revolution, uh, progressive horoscopes, yeah. and perfections. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm just, uh, I don't know what progressive horoscope means. Uh, that, that's a very uh, technical uh, question, but I'm sure you can uh, help me. Um, the progressive horoscope, well, Luis, perhaps you, well, I have to look at my, I've, I, haven't, I haven't got it exactly in mind, but uh, progressive horoscope is also, a, well, a shift of, of parameters according to a time key. Um, that is, if I remember correctly, um, the well, the well, starting from the Radix horoscope, the uh, horoscopes are calculated for different times according to, uh, to a certain key. Perhaps, Louis, you may, you may. Yeah, uh, do you mean I have, the one? I have to look up the de definition myself. At the yeah. Moment. yeah, I'm not sure exactly which which ones uh, you you you're referring here, uh, because the, the um, I'm not sure if they would be using the day for a year um, progression here at this point. Um, Hold on a second. I will look it up. <laughs> Well, sorry, that was unfair of me. I shouldn't, uh, perhaps we should, we should talk about more uh, to the point questions uh, while you're here, Gunter, and I can ask this question offline. Yeah. I mean, certainly I got your point that it meant uh, an enormous amount of, of computation for a single, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, for a single uh, horoscope, a single interpretation. Um, I have at least a, short, a very short definition. Um, <clears throat> well, a progressive horoscope you know, is based on the assumption that the constellation of each day represents a year of the native's life. That is, the horoscope on the of the tenth day calculated after the after birth time shows the influence of, of stars in the 10th years, 10th year of the native, so. Great, thank you, thanks. The, uh, I must, I may add, I may add in one source time because the definition, modern definition of progressive horoscope is I think different. Okay, um, Stefan Johnson, if you would like to ask your question, please. Thank you very much, Gunther. That was um, marvelous to hear. And I sort of got too many questions, really, um, yeah. just from, from, from the richness of what you were talking about there. And I mean, if I'm allowed, um, while well, other hands are, are, are going to go up, um, just as, as, as a follow on from what Samuel was asking there, um, did, did Rantzau use um you know interrogations or horary questions or did he use elections as well i mean if he's a great builder does he ensure that his foundations are you know are set on on the, on the appropriate day um or are things mostly starting from nativities and then these you know and, and revolutions as you've just described there i <laughs> well given the fact that he that he himself was a competent astrologer uh, it can, I think we can take it, well, I think it's very likely that he also uh, made horror, horrors and also uh, did interrogations. There are some traces left in, in this manuscript. I've, well, I haven't seen any horror question so far, <clears throat> but at least some, well, there are some in the in the relations 
there are of course some illusions to i think that he he made he he did horrors uh, before writing to the king and uh, well assessing political situations and so on at least there's an indirect reflection in in the in in, uh, in the relations in his relations Thanks very much. I mean, I, I have other, I've got other questions, but I can see there's, there's another hand up, so I will restrain yeah. myself unless there is a, an, a pause in, in, in the discussion. Okay. Uh, Margarita, would you like to ask your question? Yes, it's, uh, thanks for the beautiful lecture, and I want to show this book. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, you you can see it so yeah film. yeah i know i know this yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> just this thanks hold on <laughs> hold on a second where is it <laughs> I have it somewhere, but I can't detect it at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Michael, please. Um, Gunter, thank you very much. Since Margarita is taking the lead and showing uh, showing off books, I think we should show off yours, the uh, German edition of your Habitationsschrift on Ransel. Yeah. So I'm very pleased to have that. Um, Gunter, um, uh, just a quick question, but yeah. did you not have a quick answer? And so I hope it will go back to Stephen and to others who have further questions. Um, you showed us, if I recall, mostly um, manuscript pages that were horoscopes commissioned by Ranso from others. Yeah. That he collected. Um, could you give us a rough sense of the um, manuscripts that survive from his collection? or that he wrote himself, what share would you say are, are astrological calculations that he did himself and what share are those that he commissioned? Is it, is it possible to give a rough estimate? Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I have no figure um, actually, but uh, <clears throat> or like percentage or something, but uh, especially the Vienna manuscripts also uh, contains lots of runs his own um, calculations. <clears throat> his book publications are more an indirect reflection. That is, th these are compilations of writings, well, from other author authors who had obviously been commissioned. For example, Thomas Fink calculated Ranzo's horoscope several times with different parameters. <clears throat> and he was obviously commissioned to do so. <laughs> the source code was intended for publication. <clears throat> but uh, the, well, uh, a manuscript preserved in, as the manuscript, manuscript preserved in Copenhagen in the Royal Library <laughs> and runs us booklets with activities of his children contain his own calculations. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Stefan, please. Now again, Gunter. So, so yes, I, I, I was just very struck as you, as you were speaking about this noble household of, of, of um, Rantzau, these assistants and, and scholars that are in, they're in the household or passing through it. Um, this production, this collaborative production of, of texts and the networks of correspondence, I mean, it very, very, from, from somebody from a history of science perspective, looks at this and thinks, Tycho Brahe, this is, you know, this is absolutely the, the household mm. model um, mm. that, for, that, that, that applies to our, <laughs> our rants are, as well. And, and um, I'm just wondering. I, I, I seem to remember that there's correspondence between Ranzo and and, uh, and 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 Tycho, and I, how active is that correspondence? And what's Ranzo's response to the Tychonic program, which which is is all about novelty, really? It becomes all about novelty of you know going where, where the source at ad fontes is 
is not to the ancient books, but is to the sky mm. itself. That is the book that you should use, really. Um, and does Ratzau, do, does he um, respond to that? Do, does he believe it? Um, you know, for, for what, what is that relationship where, where there is novelty being introduced um, in <clears throat> ways that aren't just about respect and tradition? Well, there are only few letters extant. This correspondence has edited long ago, um, all this uh, completely by, by Dreyer, <coughs> the opera Omnia. But I have found no trace, no reaction to Tycho's astronomical work. Or um, Ranzo, well, did not say anything about the Tychonic model and, and so on. He was in close contact, uh, also direct contact, when when Ranzo, when Ranzo offered his castle of Wandsbeck to Tycho after he was exiled in Denmark. And there he had personal contact. But we have no written sources about on this, unfortunately. Mm. Well, that's that's very sad. Quite it's silent. Very, Quite it's, yeah. It's, it's a pity indeed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But well, we can. I must say. Well, it's always it's always dangerous to argue with probably existing sources. Yeah. Of, but <clears throat> I think it's very likely that uh, in the library at Breitenberg, more menus, uh, several manuscripts, and also far more correspondence has had was preserved originally. <clears throat> Okay, well, there, there are many, many manuscripts, and I think only a small fraction of Ranzo's correspondence has survived. But this is, of course, well, I'm, this is, of course, an assumption. Yes. Maybe there'll be some more. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Winter. Thank you. You're welcome. Samuel, please. I'm of course very excited by the the the, the brass object you showed us uh, at some point mm. uh, that you um, I'm not sure whether you said it was also from the the library uh, in Breitenberg, uh, but at least it was uh, uh, on the reverse. Uh, you had the latitude. I think it was 55. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> for which it was done. And so you could uh, kind of locate it. So, what's your uh, what do you know uh, more about this object? Um, what, uh, what what could it serve for? Do we know who engraved it? Uh, uh, what what purpose would it be? I mean, it, um, it's kind of uh, like a little book, but in brass. You could put it in your pocket. I guess. Exactly. This was exactly the purpose. It was a pocket instrument, <clears throat> folded, and you, you could fold it and put it into your into into your pocket. <clears throat> it has it's <coughs> sorry. <coughs> it has been engraved by Jakob Morris, who also created this beautiful golden box with silver inlays, and uh, engraved, of course, and punched. They are also punched in numbers and letters. And it is, in fact, uh, an eight memoir. There are uh, such tabular arrangements can be found in astrological textbooks. For example, in Johannes Schöner or Cipranus Leovitius, exactly in the same layout as here. This has, this has been copied, in fact, from a printed book here. And it is, of course, very useful when you, uh, you have all parameters at hand. Well, it's impossible to remember every boundary and every exaltation and triplicity. And uh, so you had you had you could have a quick look and look for the data and degrees. And on the other side, you could cast the horoscope. That is, you had the rising times of the science and sci science and so on. And what is most convenient in this manuscript collection or in this hand, handwritten in this paper in this collection of astrological manuscripts Ranzau handed down uh, 
uh, how it's called, in, in instruction, written instruction how to use it, which I could find and well and associated with this tablet. This is of course most useful. This instruction is available both in my book and also in German in uh, English translation in the volume on astrology and scientific instrument published two years ago or something. I don't know exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> has been transcribed and published. And, for, and with these pictures and the instruction, you get a precise idea how it worked. Thanks. Okay. Now let me just comment on this table. It's, it's very interesting because you, you, you see sometimes when you have instructions to students mm -hmm. and they <clears throat> say that for, for you to, to, to to cast a nativity or, or do a medical um, yeah. interpretation, uh, you should have always these tables at hand so that you don't make mistakes. So <laughs> this we here, I'm sure they were mentioning paper. <laughs> but I have, here we I, have I a have, more sophisticated I've version. I thought uh, <laughs> creating a modern counterpart to it sometime <laughs> would be most interesting indeed. Yeah. Yes, yes. I don't know if there are any more questions or comments. Yes, Jen please. Yes, I was, I was just going to uh, make a comment uh, to that exchange between Stephen and, and uh, Gunther there about, um, uh, about uh, Tico um, needing a new home after he'd um, mm -hmm. been kicked out of Wien and, um, and the Renzo uh, offer not coming through or not working. I was just to say that you know, Kepler would have understood that perfectly because, I mean, uh, as far as Kepler was concerned, um, that, that was too far away. Uh, God had to move uh, Tycho closer to Kepler, uh, in fact, to Prague, mm -hmm. so that Kepler could, uh, could uh, go and see him and um, benefit from the um, observations and solve the problem of Mars. So <laughs> I don't know if Ranzo knew that story that Kepler told about um, about uh, needing to uh, or the, the the destiny that was that was um, worked out when uh, when uh, God arranged for uh, uh, for Tico to uh, have to travel so far as he did uh, in order to make the revolution in in astronomy possible. Yeah, perhaps he, he might have thought about it, but uh, well, as he passed away in 1599, we yes. cannot know, we cannot know. <laughs> it's just a comment. You might give it a thought. <laughs> thank you. Um, Daniel, please. Thank you very much. It was a really fascinating talk. I was wondering if you could say something further about the, your very interesting point about this as a tool for introspection and perhaps the connection with the diary notations it was just an interesting suggestion and that you perhaps could could elaborate on yeah <clears throat> i've i have uh, shown only one page as well as, as a specimen <clears throat> there are lots of entries in this manuscript and uh, well of well the, some some of the well very trivial matters of daily life, which he, uh, well, which he correlated with celestial events. There, this, uh, <clears throat> this is also a different hand, I suppose. Also, uh, Adrian Fossenhul. That is, um, Ranzau obviously um, <clears throat> informed his surrounding the surrounding the, the surroundings of his well well-being or his temper or mood or anything like the, or well whatever <clears throat> that is he well uh, well he, he must have been quite transparent to to his fellows as uh, in Brightenburg it is uh, I, I think he uh, well when getting well, after getting up, he, well, he may have informed people in the library of his, well, of his feelings and moods or dreams or whatever. And <clears throat> I think he, well, gave permanent comments 
on his well well-being or illnesses or whatever so <clears throat> i don't uh, well i think uh, um grafton grafton's thesis is not an exaggeration i think astrology well led to a certain well in self-inspection or well um how it's called or um to uh, <clears throat> well to uh in well it's it's it is well quite i think quite modern this time that is giving attention to personal feelings and moods and so on and reactions of inner reactions and so on that is well it's it had a it, one could develop a certain sort of introspect introspection and self uh how it's called in ah oh, i'm trying to translate it from german and um, self-introspection and yeah it's perhaps self-introspection would be the, the correct expression quite modern i think or for psych psych psychological interpretation of oneself yeah i think if i think uh, ranzo uh, spent considerable time in, in his daily life with such things that is real uh, thinking about well possible celestial connections well even if he shot a stack unsuc unsuccessfully or whatever <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, no, that's really quite fascinating. I, I suppose the point is that it's it's exteriorized to the extent that the sources of influence are beyond the self, rather than from some some uh, subconscious or the other structures that we understand, you know, in a, in a Freudian kind of moment. But the, yeah. the pat pattern of thought is is uh, similar enough. So, and of course, well, he was he was a member of the highest nobility. And uh, he was uh, very close to the Danish king, and uh, well, and here and in this in these notes, he revealed well most personal things, and uh, to his well, to his uh, well to the people around him, which was I think not common. Alupanto, also Adrian Fossenhol and Forbenius, well, they were learned persons, but uh, they were they weren't noblemen. <clears throat> but uh, these people had a very personal intercourse with Ransau. That is, well, they discussed well why he had vomited in the night or something like this, yeah, <laughs> which well wouldn't well which was not very common, I think, in this, in this time. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, Stephen, uh, please. Sorry to be greedy, but, the, but, but, but as I said, there were, there, were, there, were, there were lots and lots of things that I was interested in. And one of them arises just you know, from that, you know, the, the, the inner planets, the inward planets, and, and that sort of psychological, psychoanalytical uh, dimension you've just been talking about. But, but equally, there is this, um, this very worldly external dimension to it of the political. That, you know, he's, he's writing all of his relations to the Danish kings. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to be assessing you know, both sort of um, friends and enemies and, and, and how the constellation, the political constellations are, are, are aligning. And, and, um, and I'm just wondering if there's any discussion in Rantzau's circles of the, the, the possible danger of giving away your, your identity a, and, and, and having your uh, birth details you know, publicly available because that, with a, you know, a, a skillful analyst of that, will be able to identify, um, you know, weaknesses as well as strengths. Exactly. And, 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 and I think, I think, 
doesn't Monica Azzolini have, uh, have a bit of discussion of the deliberate fake astrological news of people deliberately putting out you know, false birth information to throw their enemies off the scent. Um, and and is, there, is there any use of that that you've come across here um, of, no. of, of deliberately disseminating incorrect and you know, maybe overly strong uh, information to sort of frighten your enemies because you're unconquerable? No, <clears throat> unfortunately not, but uh, this may well have been the case. And uh, but I've I've found no direct hints in the sources on this. But uh, I I, know, I also know it from other uh, examples in the 16th century. <clears throat> and uh, and some well some people deliberately forged birth times for for themselves. There's a very famous example of Christopher Wren. When asked, when asked by John Aubrey for his horoscope collection for his birth date, and he obviously handed over a fake date to, to Aubrey, which he, uh, and he, while he was somewhat confused about the astrological results, and, and I found a note that he was aware that Ren probably had faked his, uh, his, his uh, birth time. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I think uh, we have been here <laughs> long enough. I, I'm sure there will be other questions. It was a very rich presentation. Thank you once again, Gunther. I think Thank you very much wonderful. for your kind invitation. Yes, and I, I think you showed how the practice of astrology, uh, the cultural component of it, you know, the, the, the personal identity, I think it showed very well a package of things to, to look in, in other practitioners and in other uh, in other astrological contexts of this period. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. All the best and let's keep in touch. Yes. Nice. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.